Alrighty, so uh, yeah, I'm a little bit behind on this one, but somebody reminded me to please make a video uh, just concisely going through the actual testing protocol for the zero friction cycling electric mini pump testing. So uh, here we go. Uh, so just so that you can marry up exactly how the pumps are put through their paces with the data that you can get to see, and it's obviously growing all the time to help you choose the best electric mini pump for your uh, use case. Let's have a look at how we actually arrive at all of this in as quick and concise a manner as I can drum up. Alright, so initially they're put through a series of yeah, initial performance test benchmarks. So I have a 1.2 litre uh, test tank, which I'll demonstrate. So this 1.2 litre uh, is basically a tubeless inflator tank. And the advantage of this is that we're never going to have to worry about at the start if a tire was properly sealed so there was no leakage, um, any expansion or flexibility of the tire carcass over you know hundreds to thousands of test cycles. Where like I've done over a thousand test cycles now, and obviously it's a it's a metal cylinder, so everything is the same basically all the time. And it is equivalent to, so pumping this to 70 PSI is extremely close to what most people's uh, 28C tire, you know, obviously there's going to be variance depending on internal rim widths, but we can very closely equate this inflated to 70 PSI to a 28C road tire inflated to 70 PSI. I've used 70 PSI as the benchmark. It was, I was going to go higher. I was going to go at least 80, but... Really, the um, the Silco Electrico Micro, which is pressure limited to 72 because it doesn't have a gauge, uh, kind of dictated the max limit. I, I did kind of make everything around this, which, you know, it's done now. But whether or not many other pumps will have that same limitation in the future that don't have a gauge, I'm not sure. But anyway, also, we 70 PSI is fine for getting uh, the performance benchmarks that we need. So not, not too much of a biggie. So what we do is, after the, um, the pump has been fully charged, uh, we're timing how long it takes to inflate 270 PSI. I'm recording uh, the time in 20 PSI increments for our sort of performance race chart. And obviously after it's inflated at 70 PSI, you know, we're recording that. I'm also initially recording the temperature. And that first inflation performance to 70 PSI is one of the first uh, performance benchmarks. I then record, so we do it obviously a second time, uh, I then record so the third uh, inflation to 70 PSI is also an official timed um, benchmark that is scored. And from there, so I don't have any more official timed uh, benchmark um, times to 70 PSI for rounds four and five because a lot of this category size can't inflate past four or five times. Uh, but what we get is as we inflate it until it can no longer uh, fill it up, we record the final PSI in the round that uh, it is able to make. And obviously that makes its overall endurance score. So basically in this tank, 10 PSI is one gram of air. Uh, so we get to get a nice total grams of air that a, um, a unit can pump for a full battery. So that gets us some of our initial performance benchmarks. So we can see here in column Z, uh, or Z, whichever one you want to use. So the Magic Shine Arrow took 51 seconds on the first round, which gives it a score of 10 out of 10. Uh, recording the temperature there as well at the end of the round. Um, how long did it take to inflate on the third round? Uh, it's only a one second drop to 52 seconds, so it also gets a 10. And then we're grading it on its thermal performance after the uh, third round as well. Total rounds, so we've got a total round score performance factor so that's basically factoring in its um, its weight and its inflation rate and then its overall endurance and efficiency rating so based on um, you know the size and weight of the unit and its total endurance uh, non-scored category so just its inflation times through uh, zero all the way to 120 if uh, the pump can do that and we've got a whole bunch of other fun stuff so does it have a display get some points for that uh, how much air it can pump into the uh, the bigger tank, which I'll demonstrate shortly, which is what I use for the cycle runs in between these uh, benchmark uh, test scores. Uh, we see what pressure it can uh, reach, and just just some other curiosity uh, or just you know, factors of interest that we run through initially uh, for its performance benchmarks, and that we take across to 
graphing out that initial performance and we give you really hopefully every metric that you could look for so not only its outright performance and scores but also you know its performance looking at its weight and its volume and its price um, and all that data is nicely sort of benchmark graphed there uh, for you to see and then we get to some of the fun stuff after the initial performance uh, benchmarks have been recorded in using the 1.2 litre tank for basically life cycle testing. So this is we're looking for two key things. One is its total lifespan before it dies. Two is its degradation because the main the main part that wears on these is the piston seals because it's doing you know very quickly tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands and the longer lasting ones into the millions of trips up and down the cylinder. You know at pressure at temperature those seals do wear and as those seals wear more air escapes past them on every uh, you know compression stroke or, or pumping stroke leading to blow by so each time it's trying to push air into your bike tire more and more of that starts to leak past and come back out of the pump which means it it's initially its inflation times get slower because it has to work for longer to inflate your tire and obviously that then has an impact on its endurance uh, so how much work it can do on a battery charge uh, and some pumps will you know are degrading much faster than others so the piston seals and piston design have already shown to be quite variable between different uh, models and uh, you know some of the more premium definitely have a difference and advantage over some of the less premium and some of the more premium have also been a bit of a letdown so what we do with this bigger tank because um, trying to get through cycles by using the smaller tank would it just wouldn't be able to happen. I'd, I'd have to come back and disconnect it and un, you know let out the pressure from the tank, reconnect it, and go again and basically stand because that would happen like every minute. It's a lot of intervention. You'd you'd have to set aside so much time to get not much done. This big automotive air gun tank, I can connect it, set it running, and just run it for the um, you know the, the time of the battery some have a timeout so at three minutes I've got to just come back and press the button again but that's pretty easy so this large tank enables me to run through you know full battery discharge uh, test runs so that is what is done after the initial performance benchmarking uh, then every 25th test so this is then basically run for let's say the next 24 test cycles every 25th test it is brought back to the 1.2 litre tank and the same performance benchmarks run as we have initially and that enables us to have a look at its performance degradation. So broadly there are going to be two main use categories for these, uh, this, you know, the smallest size of the electric mini pumps which I class as the basically sub 150 grams. There are those who are going to be only ever using them for punch repair in which case performance degradation shouldn't really be too much of a factor because yeah, unless you have a shocking amount of punches all the time in theory you should never have enough punches that seal wear uh, and overall unit wear will ever be an issue however it had because they most of them have very accurate gauges uh, a lot of people do actually use them to replace a floor pump because it's kind of a two-in-one in that they can connect the mini pump to their bike before they head out for a ride to check the pressure top it up as needed and then chuck it in their jersey pocket and go for a ride so it's now doing double duty it's punch repair and it's replaced their floor pump because it's very convenient for those so over time depending on how many bikes and you know how fast the tires go down and how much you're using the pump performance degradation in that use case uh, is definitely going to be something worth having a look at because there is a big difference so a number of pumps are showing that even by 50 uh, test cycles, they are done or reasonably degraded. And some of the, the smaller category pumps, their outright performance was not that fast to begin with. And then if you have reasonable degradation of performance on top of that, they just become painfully slow and impractical to use. Whereas some of the high performing pumps, so we can see here really that the two benchmarks at the moment are the Markov Air Mac Pro and the Via Recon, where even after say 100 test cycles, their performance degradation has been overall quite low, so less than 10% versus new, which is very impressive for 100 full you know, battery run cycles. Uh, and they were a high performing pump to start with. So um, 
you know, that is going to last most people because most people are not going to be using anywhere near a full battery run to, uh, to do top-ups. That should be lasting people many years of excellent performance without uh, suffering any noticeable degradation. That's really what we're looking for, as opposed to those who have had their seals fail completely or the pump fail completely quite early on or suffer quite bad degradation. So we can see here, um, even the, say the Silka, which should have, in theory, replacement seals coming soon, but that was 20% degradation after 75 cycles, so just the type of seal they're using. The Cycle Plus AS2 at 16.2%, um, and the Flextile Mini, which was already so slow, but 15% slower, it was just, phew. yeah, let's hope you're a patient person. So this is going to be really key uh, for those that are looking to for this to be their punch repair as well as replace the floor pump and I don't believe you'll well I know at the moment you won't find any other yeah longevity testing and degradation testing out there um, in cycling world uh, this is the only place doing this uh, level of testing uh, the question has come up why why zero friction cycling playing with uh, electric mini pumps and fair question like it is obviously out of my normal field of focus but it's just a little product category that I sort of found myself interested in. And I do have a keen interest these days. Must be just, I don't know, is it a middle age thing? Uh, hopefully it's a every person thing more and more. Just in the whole sustainability side. So I do worry about a lot of uh, sustainability aspects for many products. And this has been one of them. And like I think or I hope overall that they are uh, getting better than when they, they started. Um, but... Yeah, a lot of resources, I mean, I know they're small, but they have electronics, a battery, a motor, uh, and uh, generally a, a, a casing. So if they crap out early, that is something that is going to landfill in a short you know, sort of order that, yeah, that's not amazing. Um, they are meant to be replacing CO2 cartridges and you know, potentially floor plumps, so they have to be good at doing that and not just have basically landfill shipped from... A manufacturer with packaging to a short use before it's yeah now sitting in the in the dump somewhere so there's that part but two just in terms of um yeah there is quite a performance difference and from what i've seen with media so some media have uh, done a, a really good job at uh i guess reviewing and comparing but it is difficult if you're looking at a pump that hasn't been reviewed by one media that you're reading uh, has been reviewed by another but they've got different pumps that they had uh, for, re for review how the one you're considering compares to you know all of them across the two um, you know media reviews can be quite difficult because they may have different processes and a uh, different way of doing things so it's not always easy to marry that up uh, over time um, as we build up the number of pumps that we get through clearly benchmarked through the exact same testing that's demonstrated uh, that should help. It should help both consumers and it should also help media that if they, they get five pumps in, they can look at the winner of the five that they've got and perhaps compare it across some other pumps just to get a bit more balance to what they're reporting on as well. And yeah, secondary to that, but it's just yeah a little bit of personal interest in these. I just find them an interesting product category and also interested in how they may change and improve over the coming years because they have already come an impressive way from where they started but it's an area that i guess it's simple enough for me to play around with uh, on the side with my um uh, lubricant testing the big advantage i have with lubricant testing is that the zsc test protocol it is not a short uh, you know sort of clean lab based outright efficiency test which is pretty much everywhere else the zsc test uh, for the lubricants is thousands of kilometers and includes contamination blocks so we get some great much more I guess in-depth information about a lubricants performance than what you get from a short clean lab test but it is a grind of time to get through which is a big part of why nobody else would look to do the type of testing that we do uh, some have some do but and then they know like it is a massive amount of, uh, of time work. This is simpler, so it's not as bad, but still for media, they can't get through thousands of, of tests. It's just not viable for them. That test protocol and the way I can just sort of, you know, jump across and add another pump on to run another test cycle as I do my, um, 
uh, going to the wax pots and the ultrasonics as I do all the chain prep. That is something that I can, again, I can just do things. So there we are, 952 tests completed so far, or test runs. So we can just do some things, again, to hopefully add value in this area that other, no other media or uh, test site I can see would ever be able to get to. I, I just could never see how a, yeah, the mini pump's lifespan and performance degradation would ever be assessed unless I did it myself. So obviously the ultimate goal is to add value, you know, information of um, good value to people to enable the right choice. So if we, um, people that are looking at a great premium pump option, that it actually is high performing and lasts, uh, pre you know, premium priced uh, pumps that don't do that, not good, good to know. And also what budget options are there that are, um, you know, hopefully performing well and, uh, and having a good lifespan. So um, not everyone wants to spend $200. If somebody wants to spend, you know, sort of around $80, can they get something that's high performing and, uh, and has good longevity? That's the aim to find out and uh, hopefully help guide uh, purchasing decisions there. So uh, we'll have some fun key learnings from this stuff as well to, to give sort of overall wraps on uh, what we learn for, you know, X pumps versus X use cases and recommendations. But we're off to a fairly good start so far. The main thing will be just trying to drum up good interest in this um, in these vids on the channel. And uh, that will help cover the costs a lot of actually buying them and uh, doing the testing because obviously I run them till they die fairly quickly. So that rambled on way longer than I thought as always. But yeah, let me know your thoughts and feedback. I'll try to keep uh, obviously improving in all aspects as we go. But um, yeah, look out each week-ish. I normally will have a new unit in for its first performance review. And then normally about once a week, I have one that I've killed for an end of life uh, tear down. So we take them apart, have a look inside and uh, find out what went wrong. And the end of life is where I normally do the final review for that pump. So we sort of get a first look review and then once it's been killed, we have all the information that we need to know across its lifespan to do the final review for that unit and see what we think versus all the other pumps tested to date. All right, and yeah, as uh, time goes on, so once I've probably got to around about 25 uh, mini pumps done, I should really have then cover the main premium, mid-range and budget options, find out what's amazing and maybe what's uh, best avoided. Uh, we'll then look to go to more the mid uh, and large size category, which are more likely to stay home and replace a floor pump um, and potentially even a compressor for those that don't need the air burst of a, you know, for tubeless. If you're not running tubeless, you don't need that. So um, just having something that will be a, you know, very convenient, fast, solid workhorse for a long time without actually having to go to, so like a big uh, air compressor that you would get from a hardware store. Something like the, let's have a look at this one. Something like the Mega Fumper, which I can't justify buying for myself at the moment because I have a compressor, but I uh, can't wait to get to the stage where I'm testing these because I reckon something like this would be really cool. And how does it compare to some of the same, you know, name tool brand um, pumps that you would get, uh, such as, um, you know, Ryobi, Milwaukee, that sort of thing, where um, you can get some seemingly decent uh, pumps or battery operated pumps that are around this sort of size and weight and price as well. Uh, does this do something better and last longer? Yeah, it'll be fun. We'll get there. All right. I hope you join me on the journey. Uh, support where you can. And yeah, I look forward to talking with you on the next review soon.